Julie, how would you begin to repair a upper layer and a skin barrier that is really severely damaged by whether it's steroids or, or long-term damage from having eczema? Yeah. So there's a couple of different things. If someone has eczema and particularly if they're having a flare, I pretty much look at that skin and I automatically think staph aureus. And I think a lot of us think like, oh, but staph aureus, staph must be a staph infection. But that's not necessarily true. Um, really, anytime you have eczema and it's active or you're having a flare, there's probably staph that's playing a role. And the interesting thing about pH and staph is staph really wants a higher pH, a pH of about 7.5. That's where it's like, oh, I'm home. This is my jam. I'm going to grow and go crazy. And they've done studies and patients who have eczema, their skin pH is more alkaline. It's higher. So we know that this is part of what's happening is pH is not just a problem for dry, cracked skin. It's a real problem for people with eczema because we're not sure why and how, but their pH goes up. It gets more alkaline then staph aureus can overgrow and get a hold. And um, until you treat the staph, until you get rid of the staph, you're really not going to get rid of the eczema. So we do want to do things, what I talked about, you know, like things to reacidify skin, like the aloe or the hydrosol. Apple cider vinegar is another one. Um, I, we can dilute it in water and spray it on the skin, and that's acidic. It's, it's vinegar. Um, so that's great. Um, and then we want to put these healthy, you know, types of cocoa butter and coconut oil and, and things on there. But you have to treat the staff too. And I do that in different ways. Um, topically, you can use essential oils, but you need a practitioner who knows what they're doing to properly blend the concentration. Um, you can use stuff like colloidal silver topically. Um, that's pretty effective against staff. Um, coconut oil that we talked about. Um, so all of those things can help. Uh, but the tricky bit with staph is it actually colonizes the nose. So if anyone's ever dealt with eczema or particularly staph, and even when you take antibiotics, right, you clear the staph, it goes away, and then the staph is back. And it's like, oh, what happened? Like, why can't I get rid of this? Why can't I heal my skin? And it's hiding out in your nose. So it loves our man caves. It actually likes to hang out in the anterior nares, like in the hair. Um, so you have to treat the nasal colonization because anyone who's got staph on their skin, they absolutely are colonized in their nose. Um, I like also colloidal silver spray for that. I think it's quite helpful. There are pharmaceuticals like mupirocin, but mupirocin doesn't do a great job. I was actually just on a, a dermatology ground run, rounds call with one of the universities where they were talking about the fact that you know, oh, the mupirocin isn't helping with the nasal colonization of staph, and what do we do? This is where the herbals, um, herbal nasal stuff can be very helpful. And then I also find staph a lot in the gut of my eczema patients. So you have to treat the gut too. Um, but it, it is, uh, you know, the pH and the staph, they do go together. So some, sometimes just by lowering the pH and using these acidic products, and you can balance the skin enough where the staph will eventually go away because it just can't thrive. We have, um, we have these great antimicrobial peptides on the skin with wonderful names like Defensin and Dermcidin. And their job is to protect us against pathogens like staph, but they need to operate at an acidic pH. So if our skin gets too alkaline, they basically get inactivated and they can't function. So that's yet another reason why we need the pH to be low so that our skin can produce germicide and, and defense in and help kill off, you know, stuff like staph, which um, we know is completely correlated with eczema and the severity of eczema. Thank you, Dr. Julie. That is so interesting. Um, I recently actually uh, read a research paper where um, in terms of the mouth, 45% of the bacteria in the oral cavity is also found in the gut. So it's actually so surprising that the nose would also have ties to the rest of the body. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that pattern because I don't think a lot of the listeners who are listening right now 
have probably heard of that connection before. So I appreciate you for mentioning that. Yeah, and I'm glad you you brought up the mouth. It's why we find staph aureus in the gut of eczema patients. It is coming in through the nose, through the mouth, through the skin. And as part of my treatment protocols, I do prescribe certain toothpaste, antibacterial toothpaste, because we, we need to kill it in the nose and we need to kill it on the skin and we need to kill it in the gut. But if it just keeps coming in through the mouth, we're swallowing it, right? And so the point is not to kill it and then have more come in, right? So we need to use it at every point. And there's really great antibacterial toothpaste that actually improve your gum health and your tooth health at the same time that you're killing some of these oral bacteria that, you know, like you said, we find it, we swallow it and then they go to the gut. I love that you address the mouth too, because I think that's a missing piece that a lot of people aren't addressing. Do you have any toothpaste or probiotic recommendations for the mouth that you also recommend? Yeah. So as far as toothpaste, I really like Uncle Harry's brand. It comes in a jar and it's got some really great ingredients. Again, read the ingredients. Do I know what this is? So it has things like bentonite clay. Many of us have heard of bentonite clay. You might use it on your face or you might take it internally, but it's just a clay and it's really good for the teeth. And then there are certain essential oils in the toothpaste that are very good for cleaning up bacteria on your gums and teeth. And Uncle Harry's, you can just buy like on Amazon or, you know, sometimes at like Whole Foods, wherever. There's activated charcoal toothpaste, like Magic Mud that I really like. And they have things like cinnamon and spearmint and also you know, these like herbal antibacterials and the activated charcoal absorbs and kills things really great for your gums and teeth as well. There's some prescription ones that you need to get from a provider, like one called dental side that I'll prescribe for my patients sometimes, but that I don't think they sell that direct to patients, but yeah. And you'll find you'll, you'll go into your dentist, you know, at your six month checkup and your dentist will be like, wow, what are you doing? You don't really have any plaque or tartar. So it's really a win-win because you're improving your teeth and gum health at the same time that you're killing this bacteria. And then I really like Bright has a mouthwash that's like got tons of nice herbs in it, like clove. Clove is wonderful for the gums and it has lots of other things. So I, I like to have patients swish with that when they're done brushing as well. Awesome. I actually just read a really interesting study lately that said that People who do mouth breathing tend to have higher rates of eczema compared to people who do nose breathing. And I was planning to do a whole episode on this, but I just found it so interesting. Yeah, it's not surprising. Honestly, it's we, you know, we are all connected. Our whole body's connected. And I think it's still like a the major mistake that dermatologists make is just thinking of the skin. OK, let's put a topical on it, you know. It's all connected and eczema is an inflammat and a, a disease of inflammation. And that inflammation is coming from a lot of times our gut and dysbiosis. And it's definitely coming in our mouth. So that's interesting because our mouth dries out when we mouth breathe and then we can't really like fight the bacteria. So yeah, I'm not surprised, but it's it's interesting information. Yeah. So I have a lot of people that will probably try to DIY what you mentioned about the nose and killing the staph there. So how long should people be using the uh, antimicrobials or either the colloidal silver in their nose for? So let me let me start by saying that, you know, I, I don't know each of your listeners situation. So this shouldn't be construed as medical advice. And I do recommend that you find a practitioner, either a naturopathic doctor or somebody who's knowledgeable in this area and get under their treatment, because we can make a lot of mistakes when we try to self-treat. But as a general rule, I like to treat the nose, the nasal colonization for 30 days beyond seeing any sign of eczema on the skin. It's really stubborn. I have different formulas that I try depending, like there's, we've totally cleared the eczema. There's no sign of eczema whatsoever. We still treat the nose for 30 days. And then if the eczema starts to come back, I highly suspect that they're still colonized and you kind of need to switch up and do other things for treatment because it can be stubborn. And you can do swabs. I mean, if you're really not sure, you can swab the nose and get a bacterial culture and see if the staph is still up there. Sometimes you may find other stuff up there. There's fungus up there a lot and other bacteria. So it may not just be a staph problem, but yeah, 30 days beyond seeing anything because staff does not want to go. It wants to stay. Yeah, I agree with you. 
Thank you for that information. And I do agree with you that people should try not to self treat at home if possible and find someone who can really help guide your steps because it is a long process and there is a lot of digging into the root cause to look into. And、um, Dr. Julie is also very helpful as well. So later at the end of this episode, I'll just ask you to leave your contact and share with listeners about where you practice. Do you have any last words of advice or tips for people who do want to balance their skin pH or, or even anything to do with helping them heal their eczema? Yeah, so part of the advice I give my patients is pits and palms, right? And what does that mean? So, yes, we want to, I, I totally get it. We want to shower daily. I shower daily. We want to feel clean. But ask yourself, you know, if you have eczema, and here we call this the antecubital fossa or in the crook of your elbow or behind your knees, how dirty is that area? You know, did you go out and garden or like, Do something where it's really dirty and you really need to soap it. Okay, soap it. But if you really aren't that dirty, you know, if you haven't really sweated or gotten super dirty, then try on a daily basis in the shower to just soap pits and palms. So you're going to soap your armpits, you're going to soap your groin and, you know, your buttocks and the vaginal area or, you know, the penis, depending on what kind of equipment you've got. Yeah, soap all that stuff. You can wash the palms of your hands, especially now, right? We get stuff on our hands and we need to wash it off. Wash the palms of your feet, pits and palms. Those are the areas that you soap. Otherwise, don't be scrubbing with soap on your area all over your body every day, you know, maybe once a week soap. That's going to help reduce the amount of lipids that you strip off and the amount of pH that, like how much you raise it. So that's one of the first things. And then, you know, think about using some of these natural products. And yeah, re moisturizing at the end and just, you know, hang in there. I know eczema is really, it's just such a tough disease. Even as a parent of an infant or child that has it, it's almost harder because I think a lot of parents come to me feeling powerless. Like, and a lot of parents are looking like, what's the food? What's the one food that's causing this? How do I eliminate this? You know, help. And a lot of times it's really not. One food, you know, it's multifactorial. And this skin barrier problem is a big piece of eczema. And I always tell people, like, see a doctor early. When patients come to me and it's just starting, especially on an infant, sometimes we can fix it just with this work, right? We don't have to do a lot of other stuff and they haven't suffered. But, you know, when you wait, then exacerbates and it gets a lot worse. It's going to take a lot longer to heal. One, see a practitioner, and two, hang in there. I've seen the worst eczema healed. There are answers. You can find them. This is not a lifelong sentence for you or your children. And we just know a lot more now about how to uncover these root causes and heal eczema. So don't give up hope. It's definitely possible to heal it. Thank you, Dr. Julie. You mentioned something really interesting, which was about the showering. And I actually wanted to bring up the no moisture treatment, NMT. You may have heard some people talk about it, but I wanted to know your thoughts because with NMT, they don't shower very often, or some people only shower once or twice a month. Others, you know, they can vary depending on what they choose to do. But I've heard so many great things about NMT, and just not using any type of moisturizer has helped to repair their barrier. And a lot of people have said that it's the one thing that has helped their skin the most. So, what do you think about that? The no moisture treatment and not showering very often? So, I think that's a personal choice, right?、Um, it can go either way. But I think what is happening is what we've been talking about today that when you're not putting, even we talked about even water. Right? It's going to change the pH and it's going to take you six hours to get back again. So, when we're not doing these things, the, the skin is really, you know, it's not meant to be washed on this level. And I'm sure as cavemen, you know, we did go months without bathing. Maybe it was winter, right? Who's going to get into a freezing cold ice stream? You just can't do it. So, our skin is totally able to go without soap and water and moisturizer. And so I think what happens is these people's skin pH corrects. I think it will naturally acidify. Their antimicrobial peptides like germcidin and defensin are working at full blast, and their lipids are being produced and not stripped off. So their skin gets healthy. 
And like we talked about, you know, some of the moisturizers that we're putting on skin are actually detrimental. So if you're putting on petroleum based products, if you're putting on products with a lot of emulsifier, you might feel moisturized it for a little bit right after you put it on, but then that emulsifier is working to break down the lipids on your skin. It's going to leave you worse. So I don't think it's for everybody, but I think, you know, you can shower, you can use soap and, and beneficial things and that's fine. But I can see how it would work for some people just because we're working with our biology and our path, our physiology. And that's our skin is meant to work properly and be healthy when we don't get in its way. Thank it's an you. interesting thought. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's a really interesting concept that seems to work. And I appreciate that you just shared, you know, the possible theory behind why it works as well. So basically, once people finish showering, can they put the whole aloe vera gel on their whole body and then the hydrosol or either the aloe gel on their face in order to balance the pH and then put their creams on after? Yeah. So I tell people you want to go in order of like lightest to darkest. Think of, I guess it's like when we wine taste, we go from whites to reds, right? (laughs) So first you're going to get out of the shower and you're going to spray the hydrosol first. That's just a completely water-based product. So I'll spray hydrosol all over my face and body. And it really only takes like 30 to 60 seconds to dry. And then I'll put the aloe vera gel all over my face and body. And that again, you know, maybe 60 to 120 seconds, a minute or two to dry. And then you're going to want to put the oil-based thing on top. If you start with the oil, then nothing's going to be able to get through. So if you start with your like body butter or cream or something like that, and then you try to put hydrosol or aloe on it, it's really just going to sit on top and not do anything. So start with the lightest, most water based or hydrophilic, we call it products. And then you end with the oil or lipophilic products. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was a lot of great information that you shared today. And I'm sure that our listeners got a lot out of it. My listeners are interested in seeing you for a consultation or even getting in touch with you. How would they go about doing that? Yes, um, you can come to my website, which is integrativedermatologycenter.com. And as a naturopathic physician, I'm licensed to see patients all over the state of California and all over the state of Washington. So I do, even before COVID, I was doing a lot of telehealth visits all throughout California and Washington. If they're not located in one of those two states, I can't treat them directly, but um, you can still contact me and I can maybe help find a provider. Or if you have a doctor, I can consult with your doctor on your treatment plan and help get them kind of on the right path with your eczema. Yeah. And it's, or you can email me at contact at integrativedermatologycenter.com. So I'm happy to kind of funnel people towards resources to help them as well. And I love that you're also speaker at the Integrative Dermatology Symposium, if I pronounce that correctly. And I don't know if you want to share more about Learn Skin or not, if it's more for practitioners or even patients as well. Yeah, so LearnSkin.com is a site. It was started by Integrative Dermatologists. And so it is uh, skewed more towards the healthcare professional. So your naturopathic doctor, your dermatologist, DOs, you know, certified and registered nutritionists, those kinds of people. But I think, you know, we have just such smart patients who go do a lot of research on their own. And so if you're a patient who likes to really kind of like get into the science and, you know, what are the root cause of things, you might want to go. It's free to become a member. It's learnskin.com. And I'm the program chair of a series that's about to launch on June 25th called the Naturopathic and Integrative Dermatology Series. And it's a 20 course series that you take at your own pace. And we really do deep dives into all of this. So actually there is a course that I wrote called Skin pH and Skin Disease, where you can see all the, I cite all the published research to back up this information. And you can take any of the, or all of the 20 courses for free. If you're a healthcare provider, you can get continuing education credits. And if you're just a patient interested in the science, go check it out. And then there's also going to be a class, a live masterclass on June 16th that I'm hosting where it's called Functional and Naturopathic Medicine Testing for Dermatological Conditions. And I'm going to take healthcare providers through a deep dive on how do I treat like cases and patients? You know, how do I analyze stool tests and organic acid tests? I really look at the gut and the internal health of my patients particularly the more severe cases. So you can head on over to learnskin.com and 
check out some of these courses. Again, they won't be live till June 16th and June 25th, but it's all free. So it's just information if you want to go check it out. Awesome. And if people want to hear you speak as well at the Integrative Dermatology Symposium, do they just sign up or is it more for uh, practitioners as well? That is more for practitioners. So I'm one of the speakers. I'm, I'll be giving a talk on botanical like herbal treatments for different skin diseases and presenting published research on that. And we have many wonderful speakers. There are everything from MDs to NDs and nutritionists. And yeah, so it's, it's really targeted more towards, I think, the healthcare professional. But I know there are patients who are interested in check out these conferences as well. So again, it's kind of how scientific you want to get as a patient. And that's the Integrative Dermatology Symposium. It's being held in the fall and it is virtual this year due to COVID. Hopefully next year we'll all be able to get back together in person and an in-person conference. But all the sessions are going to either you can attend them live with live Q&A or they're recorded. So I think that's a really great resource for healthcare providers who are want more information about, you know, really getting to the root cause of dermatological problems. That's so great. Thank you so much for all the resources that you're putting out there and for all your speaking engagements and even for being on the show. I really appreciate everything that you're doing and all of the knowledge that you're spreading with the community. I think it's so great and that it's helping a lot of people. So thank you again for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me and and for all of your Eczema Conquerors work. And I know you're also helping to support people through eczema and steroid withdrawal and It's just a terrible disease and hopefully all working together, we're going to be able to really move this forward and make this hopefully just a thing of the past. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Julie. Thanks, Abby. Thanks for listening to the Eczema Podcast and stay tuned for our next episode. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass it along to your friends. Visit eczemaconquerors.com for more articles and tips. Thanks for listening.